My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can help me make it better in one of two ways. Number one is you can write a brief review on iTunes or number two, you can simply become a patron via interviewthefuture.com. Now, some of you may know that I've been working on a new book provisionally titled Rewriting the Human Story how our story determines our future. And so I thought it could be useful to me and interesting to you if I were to have a conversation with a few story experts and ask them questions uh, such as why story, what is story, and perhaps most importantly, how does it relate to technology, artificial intelligence, being, being human, and our future. My guest today is Will Storr. Will is an award-winning writer, journalist, and storyteller. He is the author of six books, including the Sunday Times bestseller, The Science of Storytelling, Why Stories Make Us Human and How to Tell Them Better. Will's journalism has appeared in The Guardian, The Sunday Times, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. His prizes include awards for excellence, best investigative journalism, and Best Investigative Documentary Radio Series for the BBC. So, welcome to Singularity FM, Will. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks for introducing me so generously. Thank you. My pleasure. And you deserve it because uh, I read your book very carefully. I'm a big fan. I've watched many of your presentations. And now uh, I know you've written six books. So now the other, uh, at least another three are already on my reading list to come in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. So, Will, where shall we start? Let's let's start with story. Mm. Why do you think any of us should even care about story? And the reason I'm asking is this: my audience is predominantly very highly educated um, people in IT and in the science, in hard science disciplines. Uh, about 90% of them have a university degree, about 63% have a master's degree, and about 30-some percent have a PhD. So highly educated, very so technologically sophisticated people who deal with tangible stuff, tangible cost benefits, and stuff you can scientifically investigate. So why should we bring the story of story to people like that? Why should we care? We should care because um, we think in stories. You, you know, there's there's a sense in which we are a story. You know, the, the brain is this. Um, the brain isn't a machine for analysing and assessing what's true. The, the brain is a machine for telling stories. It under, you know, understands the world in stories. It understands who we are in terms of the, in terms of stories. So, so the, so the study of storytelling, the study of the storytelling brain, is you know, is really the, the study of who we are so, so 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 yeah it's it's a profoundly important i think subject for anyone to um, be interested in whether whether they're kind of PhD, phd's or not fantastic and what is your story then will how did you come to discover story and what was kind of your journey uh, of of reaching that conclusion that you just shared with us well um so you know i've been a writer for just over 20 years now uh, professionally but but for longer than that I've been writing um so so, so that's obviously the the, the the proper root of it you know being a kind of a storyteller in that sense um and um about 10 years ago yeah about 10 years ago I started working on a book called the heretics which was published in the US it's called the unpersuadables and the heretics was um, an investigation of why smart people um, end up believing crazy things. So it's not about why stupid people believe stupid things. Because that's obvious it's because they're stupid. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, how is it that really smart people end up in these kind of crazy places? You, you know, you can find really smart people who are uh, who are anti-vaxxers. You can find really smart people who are, you know, very pro-vax. How does that work? If they're, if they're all really smart and they're not only they're smart, they, they're, they're very familiar with the literature. They understand the literature. 
Um, so, and the answer that I got to is, you know, is, is kind of what I described before is that the reason is that the brain isn't there to defi- decide what's true. The, the brain is there to tell a story. And, and in, the, in the heretics, I, you know, I, I describe the brain as a hero maker. That, that, that's what it wants to do. It's um, a psychologically healthy brain makes a hero of its owner. And, and, um, uh, and, you know, so it tells it a motivating story, a kind of a bias story, a story in which, um, uh, you know, the, the things that we believe, are, you know, are, are kind of true and, 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 you know, and it turns the world into rather than people who have different ideas about the world, um, it turns them into heroes and villains and so morally good and morally bad people. Um, uh, and, you know, essentially in that book is, is the idea that the brain is very good at uncritically accepting any idea it comes across that flatters the, its heroic story about itself and the world. And it's also extremely good at denying or disregarding and forgetting even any facts it comes across, which are unflattering to its heroic story of the world. So, 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 so that, that, that was the, you know, that, that was the beginning of me kind of being interested in this idea, you know, because it, it really changed the way that I understood um, people, understood the world, uh, this idea of the fact that everybody that I was meeting it was in the middle of this amazing story that was completely believable to them and that they believed entirely because it was being presented to them as true, even though it wasn't true. You know, it's a similar path that, that I have kind of had to discovering story about myself about four or five years ago, because, you know, I've done about 300 interviews with allegedly some of the, quote, smartest people in the world. And one thing that have, I mean, several things that have impressed me is that, you know, one of them is that what seems like genius to me uh, and what seems like stupidity to me are usually sort of uh, uh, roommates, should, if I can put it this way. They live under the same roof quite often. And it's, it's, a, it's a matter of point of view to a great extent. And uh, there's a fine line which is easily crossed and usually is crossed by people like that. And in many cases, I've had people with the same education, very similar backgrounds, but very different outlooks. And what that's one of the ways that I discovered was that the difference was the story through which they examined the science, the evidence, and the right action or the, the, the wrong action. So the story was like these these kind of color, colored glasses or actually maybe the big breakthrough moment for me was when I was interviewing Carl Schroeder who is this fantastic Canadian science fiction author and he said to me the singularity is an interesting story but it is like a normal uh, standard lens for photographers and it is very useful to have other lenses in your kit to take a wide lens or a, a telephoto lens because every time you use a different lens from your toolkit, you have a different point of view. And that makes the perspective that you get much richer instead of limiting to a single perspective. And to me, that was one of those moments that was like a light bulb going off. And so I've been doing this journey for the last, let's say, six or seven years. And so I read your book and a bunch of others on the topic. And so here we are today. But let me ask you this how do you define story that's a good question everyone's got all these different definitions of story and the one that i use um which is sort of slightly unusual I, um that, that 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 i sort of came that, that i came upon when i was writing the science of storytelling um and it's specific to the science of storytelling is that you know essentially a story is a theory about how the world works you know that that's what a story is and so that, that 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 doesn't sound very um uh, um um uh, it sounds a bit weird and odd so so I'll try and explain it. So so let's take a fictional story for example. You know what you're usually seeing in a fictional story are ideas about how the world works being tested by characters and the plot of that story is designed to test that person's ideas about how the world works. So in um Death of a Salesman the play by Arthur Miller Willie Loman is the is the central character. He, he's motivated by this sent this idea that 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 success, financial success, career success is all that matters. That's all that matters to him. 
and uh, and that that's the motivating idea that, that around which he kind of organizes his life and so so what we see what happens in the plot is that you know he's he, he, his, his his sons come home and they're kind of losers they're kind of school dropouts and he, and he can't handle it he goes crazy and you know, he forces them, he kind of bullies them into, hectors them into going out and trying to get some work. And, and, and what we see as the play unfolds are the kind of the ramifications, the negative ramifications of um, uh, Willie Loman's idea about how the world works, that success is all that matters. It breaks his family apart, like it is a disaster. And so that's Arthur Miller testing this idea. You know, is it true that success is all that matters? And Arthur, Arthur Miller, you know, being a, being a lefty writer, as most writers are, um, is is no, and he's showing you why it's no. So, so, so that's why that's true in in the story story realm. Um, you know, the, the great characters which, which which kind of populate our great stories, you often um, are kind of um, have these certain maybe one idea about the world. Like Scrooge has this idea about the world that I'm only safe. I'm only safe if I keep all the money and love to myself. And that story is a test of that idea. It's a test about how the world works. Um, in, in a more literary story, say like a Jonathan Franz, and I'm reading his new, new novel at the moment, they're much more complex characters that might, might, might have a series of sort of intersecting ideas about how the world works. But it's still the same principle. The story is testing this person's idea about how the world works. And we see if it's a, if it's a happy ending, you know, they end up with the right idea about how the world works. And if it's not, that it's it's proof, it's proof that this idea doesn't work. So, so, so that's how that works in fiction. And it's also the same, you know, the, the same um, idea in the human brain. You know, in, in, in Sansa storytelling, I, I, I kind of sort of sort of build this idea that I call the theory of control. And that what a human character is, what a human self is, is this kind of set of, set of interlocking ideas about how the world works. Ultimately, all living things want control. We, we, that's what we're trying to do all the time: is control our environment to, con, you know, because to, to survive and reproduce and get all the things that we want out of the environment. The human environment is social. You know, we have evolved to be a hypersocial ape, and and so 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 our, you know, you know, sometimes our severe of control, like yeah, as we're seeing in the, in the world stage at the moment, is violence. Uh, but more often. It's manipulation. We're trying to control other people, and people have different way, manip you know, tactics of manipulation. Different personality types have different ways of trying to control the social world around them. And and and, and the kind of the sum, the story, you know, the sum of the human self. That I argue in the book is this is is this theory of control, and and what happens in life when we when 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 you know when, when unexpected change and crisis and obstacles are thrown at us is our theories of control are being constantly tested. And if we're living a, you know, a, 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 a functional, successful life, hopefully we're constantly updating our theories of control. We're constantly building our, you know, and, and adding nuance and complexity to our story of the world and how the, how the social world works. So that's, so that's, the, so, so that, so that's, that's my answer to that question. It, I don't think, I think, it's, I think it's a unique answer, I, but, but I, that's to me what a story is. It's, 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 it's a theory about how the world works, specifically a theory about how the social world works usually. But not always. James Bond is, is not, it's, it's about you know, <laughs> how, how do I destroy enemies, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a different story targeted at different audience. Um, I don't, I don't think it's such a unique definition, uh, and I'll tell you why, for a number of reasons. First, my own definition that I'm, my working definition of story in my book so far uh, is close to, and maybe even synonymous, you tell me if that's the case or not, but I started with uh, Kenneth Burke's definition that story is a tool for living. Mm. And then I, I went through... Uh, uh, what's his name? Jonathan Dochambeau, I think is his name, uh, definition that story is about uh, information processing. And then I kind of merged them and tweaked them a little bit and came up with my own definition, which is story is an information processing technology. It's mm -hmm. about information because there is a transfer of some kind of substance or, or some kind of information, either from one person to another or from one generation to another, it could be across space or time, etc. It's about processing, however, 
because it's not just about the information. It's about that aha moment. It's it's about the fact that the sum of the parts are more than all of the parts together. So story has this this kind of moral of the story, this kind of twist, which adds up to more than the sum of the parts. So it's really about the processing of the information, not so much about the information, but about what it means. And finally, it's technology, because it's a invention or at least creation of the human mind. In other words, it doesn't exist outside of the human mind. It's not a natural phenomenon out there in the physical world, but it's a it's a kind of a fictitious phenomenon that's a creation or an invention of our brains. So does that make sense to you? And is that synonymous to to what you define story as? Um, I, I, it, it, it's certainly you know not a million miles away. It feels it feels a bit kind of I mean I, you know I guess you're still working on it. It feels a bit vaguer and a bit more woolly, but but like um but yeah you know it, it doesn't feel a million miles away. Uh, you know it feels a bit like you're describing also describing culture, um, which of course is connected with story. Well, culture is a story. It's, culture isn't culture a bunch of people embracing a common story. So when you have the the culture of democracy or the culture of whatever, this soccer uh, uh, team uh, or the culture of, uh, you know, defending the fatherland or, or the culture of, uh, you know, uh, what safety buffer is and, and what a nation is or what a corporation is. All those are stories. There are stories at different level. At the, the, I mean, our identity, everything, all of that is a story at the individual and collective levels. Yeah, sure, of course, yeah, yeah. And and uh, by the way, a very close. Uh, I interviewed Werner Vinge, uh, and you know I've interviewed probably at least a dozen famous science fiction writers, and I've asked them, oh, what is science fiction to you? Because every one of them have a, has a different definition, and you know you define story as uh, a theory of, of how the world works. Well, Werner Vinge told me that science fiction is about for him was about trying to make sense of the universe. The universe, uh, wow, that is ambitious. Well, yeah, well, you know, fine, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, you know. Right, because uh, the, of course, yeah, the yeah, world... You're going to have different answers for, from lots of different people, yeah. Yeah, whether the world is like our planet or the world is our universe or whatever, you know, and he's a grandiose science fiction writer, so of course he'll be talking yeah. about the, the universe. Uh, but, but, I mean, it's it's kind of, to me, what you said about story, so so that's that's very interesting. But you know, I, I yeah, I have to work on my definition to improve it, especially the explanation of it. And I have a lot more than. But thank you for that tips. It seems that I didn't quite get it right this time around. There. Um, so where does that take us in terms of the impact that story has? So you said that our brains work through stories and story is a theory of how the world works. So if I were to paraphrase Lisa Cron here, she says that story is the language of the brain and Jonah Sachs says, by the way, that stories are our cultural DNA, which is like, again, bringing, uh, closing the loop to the point about culture that you made. And to me, a culture is a story. It's like a bunch of yeah. people accepting a story and follow because a story tells us who we are, where we're coming from, where we're going, what is right, what is wrong, what's the purpose of life, and how is what are the best ways to to live it, and what are the worst ways to live it. So it's giving us all these instructions. There's all these implications and you know repercussions of embracing a story. So. Would you so so would you say that a story is a is a positive or a negative force or how would you describe it or a natural force? I say it's both. You know, it's absolutely both. Um, you know, story can be an amazingly galvanizing, inspiring. You know, it's just it's like the story of our life is what gets us out of bed in the morning. If it wasn't for story, we'd just be, you know, you know, like you know, we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick. Everyone we love, everyone we love is going to die. That's the truth. You know, and, and that, there's no heaven. 
there's nothing. We, we, we're fucked forever. That's the truth. It's depressing. But what gets us out of bed in the morning is the story. And the story is that what I do really matters. This podcast I'm doing is going to change the world. This book I'm writing about storytelling, it's going to be amazing. You know, these are the stories. It's, you know, like, like I do it, you do it, we all do it. So the so, so story is, is fantastic. It's, it is what gets us out of bed in the morning. It's what motivates us. These dreams we have, these happy endings we, you know, we create for ourselves in our heads and we strive over the obstacles to get to them. That's all story stuff. That's the hero making brain going, come on, you're a hero, you can do it. It matters, it matters, it matters. I mean, look at the religious story. You know, the religious story is this, is this, is this imaginary, you know, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, whatever. It's, it's this... It, it, it's this it's this creation of the shared imagination um, that that absolutely gives incredible meaning to to, to, to millions billions of lives around the world. Um, so you know, it works. So it works. So, so, so yeah, stories you know can be amazing. But of course, you know, again, in the in 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 the um, in the example of religion, it, it can it can also galvanize galvanize us into. Um, acts of absolute, you know, depravity, you know, injustice and and horror. So, 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 so you know, if we say that story is what brain does, story is how we understand the world. You, you, you know, you 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 can't you 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 can't just say it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, it's it, it, it's both of those things. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and and. The reason why I'm asking, though, is because uh, I also recently read uh, Jonathan Gottschall's book, probably right after yours, called The Storytelling Paradox, How Our Love of Storytelling Builds Societies and Tears Them Down. And he, he has this quote there that says, Story science reveals that everything good about story is the same as everything bad. To get good <laughs> people to behave monstrously, you must first tell them a story. So the real question is, how can we save the world from stories? Because the the science, I've had this, the, the conversation about the importance of story with many scientists many times. And the way they push back when I say what you just said to me about the importance of story and how we should care and all that, is that they tell them that it, one, seems to be bringing us to cultural relativism when there is no right or wrong. Um, and science likes to have clear delineations. Uh, science likes to live to to live to work in in a realm where you know you're either right or you're wrong. There's no real in between. Uh, and and also, uh, if if they accept that, they don't see a way out of our predicament. So, in other words, how do we save the world if it's all about stories and if if everyone is embracing an incompatible story with the next person at the global scale. How do we survive well, as it, a species? It, it, it's a, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a good, it's a really good question because, um, you know, I think what we're seeing in the modern era, that especially the post-internet era, that certainly the post-mass media era, the post-internet era, is this proliferation of stories. So before the era of mass media, um, there, there, there were a few stories that, 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 that nations and cultures could galvanize themselves around. There was the national story. You know, my country is amazing. It's fantastic. I'll fight and die for my country. That's how I'm going to be a hero in my life. Well, there's the religious story. Um, you know, and there were obviously be very, various local stories, my town, my village, my farm, um, whatever. But, and, but now, um, you know, you know we, we're kind of drowning in stories. And, 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 I, and I think what you're seeing is this kind of atomization, this desiccation of uh, especially if the, uh, maybe not just the west but certainly from a western perspective um <clears throat> you, you know people that you know one of the one of the sort of most memorable quotes that i've ever sort of encountered in my career as an author and journalist is my first book that i wrote 20 years ago it was about ghosts and ghost hunters and i wanted to find out you know um, why people believe in ghosts and what was going on there. And I met this very famous ghost hunter called Morris Gross. He's dead now. Uh, he was in his 80s at the time. And as I was leaving his house, he said, you know what, Will? He said, if you want to find evidence of the supernatural, if you go looking for evidence of the supernatural, you will find it. And at the time I thought, oh, wow, you know, amazing. Um, but, but now I, I've learned that, 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 that if you want to find evidence of anything, 
you're going to find it. If you go look it, you're going to find it, especially in the internet age, you know, and how that kind of storytelling brain works is, you know, in a nutshell, in, in a kind of simplified version, we're mostly emotional. We respond to the, to the world, you know, instantly and emotionally. And then the story, the story comes after that emotion. And, you know, generally speaking, nine times out of 10, the story that you're going to tell about the world um, just, 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 just confirms that emotion. Um, so, and so, 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 you know, so, 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 so we're constantly um, telling stories about the world that kind of reassure us that our kind of emo our subconscious emotional kind of instincts um, are correct. You know, uh, you know, the, the, the brain always wants to be in this state of cognitive ease, where it's not being challenged. You know, it's not being challenged. It just wants to, you know, go, go, go around the world and under understanding it in ways that, it, that it, it, understanding it, it, it through the lens of the stories that it already kind of kind of believes so so, 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 so yeah I, you know I, I, with the internet um you know pe pe there are all these kind of people that have all these different and emotional instincts and responses to the world and now just with a click, click of a few buttons on the on the internet they can find communities that believe all sorts of things and, and, and tell them all sorts of things so we've got all these we've now got this proliferation of, of almost infinite you know story communities that believe certain things about the world i mean you know it, 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 if you were somebody that had a propensity to believe that the world was flat or i did a story once on people who believed the world was hollow and, and inside the world was dinosaurs <laughs> that's what they believe you know you, you're not going to find other people who believe that story um in the world around you but now you can you can go on the internet and find a whole community of these people some of them go exploring i think there's a hole in the arctic circle where you can actually get in and some of them are trying to travel to the hole so so, 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 so yeah i mean that, that, that's the problem you know the, the the problem is there are too many stories now and and, and we, we're kind of desiccating and atomizing as a um, um as a society i you know obviously the question of how do we fix that is you know perhaps almost impossible to answer i i think um you know as i, as I write in the heretics that the cure for you know the cure for stories science is the scientific method you know to to a to, to a degree you know just you know this scientific method you know it's imperfect it moves forward by you know by degrees and you know and, it, and um people you know that you know the ideas change and evolve and sometimes occasionally there are big paradigm shifts but science is the is, is the method we've developed to kind of break through this kind of the spell of the story and i and i think it will continue to be that way that that that, that, that I, mean, I hope that that we will continue to be uh, you know an increasingly scientific um, 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 you know, based the species that that that, that bases our um, beliefs and ideas in empirical truths rather than in you know instinctual knee-jerk tribal story truths. So let me. There's several directions here we're going to go. Uh, let me just do one correction, uh, perhaps, or consideration. You know, Yuval Noah Harari, who is one of the world's best-known historians right now, perhaps, says that it is actually not true that right now we have a proliferation of stories. Actually, right now, in his opinion, it's the exact opposite. We have an amalgamation of stories. And so the number of stories through time, when you look at it historically, is not rising. It's absolutely the opposite. It's diminishing. So you gave an example of only a couple hundred years ago, but in his view, history spans millions of years. So if you just look at the human race in the last, let's say, a few tens of thousands of years, first of all, we've had something like five or 6,000 different kinds of languages, and so which most of them are now extinct, but each language tells its own story and has its own myths and its own stories. And then you had kind of each of those communities that spoke their own languages had their own stories. Whereas now in the world, you're converging to basically half a dozen to a dozen stories. There are not too many. And the whole, uh, in his view, for example, the 20th century... <laughs> so I, I Half a think... dozen stories in the world. That's what... That, 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 that's, that, that's the... That's well, the, the, how many religions are there in the world? They're all a story. How many conspiracy theories are there in the world? They're all a story. How many 
you know, political groups are there in the world? They're all a story. I, I don't understand this argument at all. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I mean, you know, looking looking through the broad sweep of history, when we were living in hunter gatherer forager groups, how many stories would have been in that group that have been the you know the, the groups myths and legends about the world, um, its creation myths, um, some ancestral story. I mean, Jesus, you could find. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we've got different definitions of what what, what a story is. But my understanding of Harari um, is that he has a very, very broad um, definition, probably broader than mine. In his book, he he, he says that the, the car company Peugeot is a story, which is, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's what he argues. So if he's arguing on the one hand that Peugeot is a story, but he's also arguing there's only six stories in the world, what about Fiat? What about Volvo? What about Lexus? What about, like, what? Well, I don't understand this argument at all. It seems bizarre to me. Well, so so let me let me be more more accurate here. So I I put words in his mouth like that. I I he never said that there's half a dozen stories, right? Uh, okay. But in right. his book Sapiens, and I can give references to that, um, he definitely says that there is a diminishment of the number of stories, uh, and he looks at it from the global level, and maybe he means, for example. He talks that the 20th century is a clash of three major stories, fascism, capitalism, and communism. And so fascism was one mm. of the first stories to go away. Then eventually in 1989, communism collapsed. And then the last story standing, major story about how our civilization should work and, and, and the major myth of our civilization remained to be capitalism. And then intellectuals like Francis Fukuyama went on quickly to proclaim the end of history because you see, according to Fukuyama, history is not only, I mean, capitalism is not only the, the, the best story we've ever told, but it's the best story that could ever be told. So really from then on, from 1989 onwards, we were just tweaking the capitalism story, but we couldn't come up with a better one because that was kind of the peak for Fukuyama. And so the end of history, therefore, right? And so uh, I feel the same way like you, by the way. I feel the same way about Fukuyama. I respect Harari, though, and and I, I, I'm I trying to make sense the, with the fact that he's a historian with, with a great depth of knowledge. And for him, maybe the, the sort of the mythical stories of how a society or a civilization should be run uh, is the one that maybe he's referring up to with the idea that when you had 5,000 world languages and you had 5,000 local cultures and each of them had their own flavor and idea about what was important to them and how they should run themselves and uh, what's the best way to organize themselves as a community and etc. And then you had this kind of globalization, which literally annihilated those languages. They went extinct. All those cultures went extinct. And now we have this. Even on his own, even on his own terms, that doesn't make any sense. It's very Western focused talking about capitalism, fascism, and communism. What about Islamism? Huge parts of the world are run uh, under an Islamic story. I used to live in Australia. What about Aboriginal communities? You know, it's it's a it doesn't it's a, it's a, it's a, so you you to argue that there are only half a dozen stories and there are three major stories. You're, you're having to take an extremely reductive, extremely reductive definition of what a story is for a start. And also, you're gonna you're having to ignore huge chunks of the world <laughs> that, that aren't you know western so 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 so, so I, i'm still confused I, I and i still you know if if his, if his theory is the is as you describe it i i think it's i think it's crazy you know i think it's i think it's mad well fair enough okay uh okay so in that case we'll move on i actually used uh so great i as far as Francis Fukuyama goes, I am 100% with you on that. I think Yuval Harari made, he had this online course that I took a long time ago uh, where he kind of expanded a lot more on that idea and I've taken it 10 years ago. So let's say I probably butchered his idea, but the bottom line of it was that there used to be more stories before than they are today. And today we have, and that's part of the globalization basically 
brings everyone under the same umbrella. Uh, and even perhaps why I'm just trying to figure out how we can make sense of his, like, let's say you, you're talking about Islamization, the Ummah, right? You said, you said the Ummah, which spanned from, let's say, Indonesia all the way to Northern Africa and Southern Spain, gargantuan sort of the Islamic Ummah. But before the Islamic Ummah, each of those was a single cut uh, or consisted of very tribal, localized kind of communities with their own languages, with their own cultures, with their own myths and legends, with their own religions, if you will, right? Mm. Then the Ummah took over. Even if you look at the Arabian Peninsula, where Islam arose, same story. You had all these localized tribes, each of whom had their own kind of ideas. And then Muhammad kind of brought them under the same umbrella, and then under the banner of Islam, they almost took over the world, and they were stopped at Vienna in Europe, and then southern Spain, and all the way to Indonesia. But, I mean, in a way, you could say that they kind of globalized the world, or Islamatized it, in a way, and had many of those ideas extinguished, and mm. brought one single idea with them called Islam. And that's the first rule of Islam or the first law of Islam is like, there is only one God and his name is Allah. That's it, period. Yes, but, 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 but my, you're in short, you know, the, what we were talking about were the, you know, were the problems that, st that, that, that the, you know, storytelling brings to us as a society. And I was describing a world in which we have, lot, we have infinite, variety of stories that we can choose by which to live our lives so so, so you know we, we're talking about you know slightly different things so you know if i'm sitting here in the uk in kent um and you know that the, 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 there are there, there is almost no limit to the amount of stories by which i can live my life i can become an environmentalist i can become an anti-vaxxer I can become um, uh, a Dungeons and Dragons freak. I can, you know, all, all these are all these are different ways of performing the hero. All, all, all these, are, you know, I can become a um, a Church of England person, a, Christ, a, a Catholic person, a Protestant person. I can become a Buddhist. I can, you know, it's like the the, the menu is it, it just just doesn't end. So, so so the amount of stories there are available to me are almost infinite. And so you know, and you know, if, if I was existing you know we, we were members of sort of you know forager groups for 100,000 generations if I was in one of those forager groups that wouldn't be true I wouldn't have this I, I would be I would be born a man and that means you, you you're either a, a, I don't know, a storyteller or a hunter and that's what you are you're one of those two things and you have to believe this stuff it's that you know because this is these are the rules of our these, these, this is, you know, these are the rules of our tribe. These are the stories of our tribe, and this is our creation myth. And you have to believe that. So what I'm talking about, so you know, what I'm talking about is the amount of is the stories that we have on offer to us. You know, the the, the range of stories by which we have by, by which we can live our lives, and, and and it's huge now, and that leads to an atomization of our societies because people can choose all kinds of different things. I mean, Jonathan Haidt's next book um, is called, I think it's called Three Stories About Capitalism. And that, um, I mean, you know, it's, yeah, that, that, that in itself describes three different ways that we can understand capitalism. You know, one of them, capitalism is exploitation. You know, capitalism is this awful thing that's happened. And, um, you know, it's all about the, the, the rich exploiting the poor and it's terrible. And then there's another story about capitalism, which is it's freedom. Because before capitalism, we were all serfs. And, you know, like they, they're both so, 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 even, so, so, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So, 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 so like, you know, I, I just don't accept that there are like I, I can see the logic of your thing that the, the argument that Islam Islam unified a bunch of warring tribes that had all their own little stories. But now in the era of kind of, I would say in the era of, era of mass media and internet, we've more than replaced, you know, we, we've replenished that kind of, you know, spent store of um, tribal stories. Um, yeah. And also, again, by Harari's own logic, I mean, in that book, he, he says that Peugeot is a, is a story. That's what it is. And so, so, so yeah, that's why I don't understand. Yeah, so he seems to be, I don't know if he's shifting his definition of what a story is. No, but or, or, but, or whether I'm not understanding something about he his argument. He says that Peugeot is a story, just like Citroën is a story, just like, you know, Land Lover or Jaguar. That's three stories. That's, stories. That's, that's, that, well, we're on nine now. 
Was, right. <laughs> right. No, but but I again I misspoke there when I said half a dozen uh, stories. I okay, was talking yeah. about the political sort of the civilization. Oh, yeah. Why I was talking yeah. about like fascism, communism, and and capitalism. That's what I was yeah. talking about. Right. Yeah, the yeah, way yeah, of yeah. organizing the civilization. Right. I'm yeah. not, I wasn't talking about some you know lower level stories like uh, the, okay. the brands. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. And again, he never said that the way I said it. So again, that was probably my fault. <laughs> but but he says that the 20th century is a clash of three stories. And I think that makes yeah. sense to me. Right? Oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. On that on that scale. On that and level, before yeah. that, you could say there's many ways you can you can slice it. So you can slay, say there's a, a clash between Christianity and Islam and the Crusades were, uh, you know, the clash of civilizations, as Samuel Huntington supposedly argued. Uh, or you could even cut it different way. You can say that so far we've had two major stories in the humanities history. The first one was the story of religion. However you want to cut it, Christianity, Islam, it doesn't matter. That's religion. And the second story is after, let's say, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the story of science. And supposedly what we're witnessing today is the collapse of that second story and the, 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 the vacuum that, that is forming with the fact that science in itself alone hasn't been able to demonstrate itself to sufficiently replace religion and bringing peace and harmony and saving humanity. Right. So before that, it used to be the case. God would save us, pray to God, follow God's <laughs> instructions. Right. Then we mm -hmm. had this kind of very brave idea that we are gods. We killed God, as Dostoevsky said. Right. And we transhumanism advises that we become gods. We are the gods. So therefore, we might as well start behaving as such as Stuart Brand says. Right. But now a response to that. For, which has been happening for the last 300 years is since the Industrial Revolution is, look, science was in charge since the Industrial Revolution and look where it's brought us. We are literally probably on the way of committing a suicide in so many ways. And today we have a war in Ukraine between only two countries right now, but with the potential to, to become World War III there. And you can't have that war of that scale with that potential of destruction and potentially planetary suicide without science and technology. And so some have said that, you know, science, uh, uh, the first story that humanity had was a religion. It worked and then it stopped working after a certain point. It brought us thus far, let's say to the 16th, 17th century. It took us through the dark ages. Eventually, we had the story of science, which emerged as the dominant story for our civilization at the global level. So there's still very small numbers of stories. That's what I'm trying to say here. And then now this story is collapsing too, in a way, and it's this gap or this vacuum that's forming at the civilization-wide level that our civilization is, is looking to find. Um, let me find the quote here. I, Jonathan Sachs has a... Uh, uh, no, Jonah Sachs has a very interesting book called uh, the the um, the upcoming story wars, and on page fifty eight he he defines this called the myth gap, and he says this the space between the realities of our moment in history and the shared stories to which we turn for explanation, meaning, and instruction for action, are what he calls the myth gap. And so stories, as we said, tell us who we are, where we're coming from and where we're going. And now our myths, our stories that have brought us to the 21st century, that have armed us with nuclear weapons, that have allowed us to send stuff to Mars and beyond and to become gods in some way or another, are now falling apart. And there is this myth gap. There is this vacuum. So we need a new story, according to that thesis, to plug in the vacuum, to... to give us a new idea about how we should peacefully coexist with each other. Religion is no longer enough. Science is no longer enough. We need a new story. What do you think of that? I don't share that kind of pessimistic view. and Because it, it sounds to me like we're saying, well, because, if, because the world isn't perfect, modernity has failed. 
And, and I just think that's that, that's crazy. You know, modernity is a process. Um, I, I also don't agree that religion has failed. I, th I think billions of people around the world um, get enormous amounts of meaning and purpose from the story of religion. Um, science certainly hasn't failed. It's, um, it, um, uh, you know, it's lifted, you know, well, science and, and more broadly, you know, technological progress and civilization has lifted billions of, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, you know, around the world. It's saved, you know, hundreds of millions of lives, perhaps more been saved by, you know, vac vaccination programs of the last 100 whatever years. So to say that science has failed, I think is crazy. And actually what I'm hearing from you is a stories. I'm hearing, um, you know, incredibly complex evolving systems like religion and science reduced to heroes and villains in a story that, you know, the, these are villains, they failed and we need a new hero to come in and save us all. Religion, science, they're complex, um, they're complex phenomena. Um, and, and like all complex phenomena, they have, there's a huge range of trade-offs in terms of their results. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be bad. Religion has loads of great trade-offs. My parents are very religious. My mother, very Catholic. You know, her entire life has been devoted to serving the church. I don't believe a word of it, but I would never take it away from her because her life would collapse. That's her story. That's her identity. That's a hero, you know, people file machine or certainly was it up until you know you know recent history so so, so 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 to kind of reduce something like religion or something like science into these kind of it's a good thing or a bad thing it's succeeded it's failed that that, that itself is the storytelling brain turning complex phenomena and, and a phenomena that's still evolving into simplistic goodies and baddies in a narrative as, as far as i can see so what's the the better way to break it down well let, let, I, 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 i'll tell you how i how i break this down okay so so so, so we've been talking um so far about the, the storytelling brain and the storytelling brain is the conscious part of the brain so the brains that our conscious experience of the world is a story it's an act of creation from the ground up with special effects biases all of that stuff um but there's also all this other stuff going on the vast vast majority of the brain which is subconscious and the subconscious brain isn't telling a story. Like my, you know, my, my, you know, my most recent book is the Status Game, which looks at kind of one aspect of this of this game. And and so 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 what are the ultimate kind of causes of our behaviour? Um, you know, what 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 is the subconscious brain actually trying to get out of the world? Well, it's a few things. It's three things essentially: is survival and reproduction, obviously. Um, it's connection with tribal. We want belongingness. We want to feel like we're we, we are successful members of a group. And it's also status. You know, we, we want to feel that we are, we are valuable people, um, you know, you know um, we want to feel that we are more valuable than the people around us, ideally, as what makes us happy, happiest. Um, so, so, so that's what's actually going on. And, and, and so in the status game, I tell the story that you, you, you told a moment ago about the, about the progress of history, but from the point of view of the status game. So there are three ways that humans play for status. There are three strategies that we have subconsciously to, to earn status. The first way is dominance. So, you know, the Putin, <laughs> the Putin uh, way. We fight, we force, we, 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 we make people attend to us with respect. We bully them or we, we beat bully them. them. We beat them or threaten them. It doesn't have to be violent. It could be threatening too. So that's yeah. dominance. We've been doing dominance for millions of years since we were animals. Well, sure. we are animals still, but yeah. Um, and, then, and and uh, yeah, right. exactly. And then, and then when we became human, well, when we became uh, when we started settling down into communities, we you know once you, when you're living in a community, you can't just be beating each other up all the time and killing each other because we'd all be dead and and life would be hell. So we started. Um, um, we, we started playing new kinds of status games, and that status games is reputation. And there are two ways in, in the tribal days um, of earning a good reputation. Uh, well, well, essentially, what you're trying to do is prove that you're of value to your tribe, you're a useful person to your tribe. That's how you rise in reputation. There's two ways of doing that. One is with virtue, by being a morally good person. So that's somebody that um, knows the rules, sticks to the rules, enforces the rules, you know, worships the gods, practices the rituals really well, also somebody courageous in battle. So that's how you earn a virtue status. 
And there's also success-based status, so this competence, which is being a great honey finder, a great storyteller, a great hunter, being skillful. So that's another way of earning status. So dominance, virtue, and success, they're the three status games of human life. They were the, th they were the three status games of human life 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, and they are still today. And what you see as, you, as you're moving through history <clears throat> is this great movement from dominance through to virtue gains. And that long era in which we were um, um, uh, tribal and then settled and then religious was very um, virtue dominated. You know, when you're playing a virtue game, you're being subservient, you're being you know, obedient, you're knowing your place and staying in it. It's, it's a world of caste. Um, uh, and, and you know, not being ambitious. It's a it, you know, it, 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 it's a it, it's a kind of a closed, suffocating kind of world. And what the Enlightenment was, you know, the Industrial Revolution was this shift, this great shift from virtue games into success games. You know, we, we, you know, it's not binary. We still play, we still play all three games now. But, the, but there's been a huge change in emphasis. We started awarding status for acts of competence. So, 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 so a working class man in the UK um, could, could, be, could be born poor, work out how to, how, how to solve some incredible technical problem, like how to fucking smelt iron or something, and then rise in status and become rich and famous and wealthy. And that had never happened before. And so that's the beginning of a modernity. So, so that's how I see the, the truth of the story that you outlined it's just this it's, it's this change in the ways that we're playing status games and what we just do is tell stories that explain and kind of you know add this kind of you know the story framework of heroes and villains and morality on top of that but but that's but that, that that's that's what we're doing and and, and I think that, that that actually this shift into playing success games this shift into having a system whereby we principally award people status for acts of competence is incredible it's the best things that have happened to our to our species uh, uh, you know and it goes on and, and it's going to shift and move I think you know in the in the book I argue that post 2008 global financial crisis but there's been a shift back into virtue games a bit so if you think about the world from the 80s onwards it was success 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 Gordon Gecko, greed is good everybody wants to get rich I mean look at Russia and you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union um, and then uh, in 2008 the global financial crisis th th this story emerges and with with some truth in it that actually the game is fixed and especially for the younger generations for the millennials and gen z's you ain't going to be as rich as your parents or your grandparents you, you know you know you, you've gone to university you've done everything you've we've told you to do but you're going to come out without a job or or with a job working in the media earning almost no money you know so so, so, so they so, so, so there's this the, 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 there's this story now that, that actually success is the success game is fixed and you see this reversion into the virtue games which we see in terms of things like you know the you, you know social justice movements and the you know the, the, the increased focus on things like sustainability and ecological kind of interests so so, so, so that's that's how i see the reality of of, of human history that's the subconscious kind of real politic of, what, of what's going on if, is we're playing these status games uh, and, and the stories that we tell about them are are interesting but i think the real the, the real story is, is in is is in this is in this subconscious truth that that makes sense and and of course it all comes from your most recent book called the status game which is a fantastic book and i recommend people check it out too but what strikes me is that you just told us a story didn't you and in, it seems in my book, the way I would define story and maybe Yuval and a few other people like Seth Godin, status is a type of a story. It's a story about who you are in comparison to others. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, of course, it's related to story, you know, like so, so what you often see in story is, you know, stories tell of status movements. You know, you know, Luke Skywalker begins low status, ends up high status. Harry Potter ends up low status, and then uh, uh, so it starts low status, and ends up high status. Uh, you know, villains start high status and go low status. So, so, so that that subconscious real politic is still in story. I and mean, we think about heroes, we think of people becoming high status um, people. But 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 it stops being a story when it starts being scientifically validated. You know that, that that that's why I say that science is the is is the kind of method by which we, that we've come across to kind of dis, to break to try and break the dominion of story. You can prove stuff with science. You can try to. 
You can mount a scientific and empirical argument that, that isn't a story. So, so you know, what, what I told you was a story in the sense that it was narrative and it was cause and effect. And but 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 you know, if you've seen the status game, it's it, 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 there, there, it's a, there's a thick <laughs> notes and sources section at the back. Um, so, it, and that for me is what makes it what what, what makes it not simply a story it, because it's it's based in the actual reality of of the history of our species, and you know, voluminous evidence from psychology, from history, from econ from economists, from anthropologists, from sociologists, and, and and so on. Right, but what I'm trying to to argue here is not against science, of course, mm. but about the context and how it determines what a status is, whether it's low or whether it's high, or whether even if someone is successful or not successful, because you're talking about, you know, the industrial revolution and the enlightenment and competence and success and results, uh, sort of, uh, which is kind of, I think, in some ways, maybe also a simplistic way of looking at things, because Think about it this way, Enron and WorldCom and a bunch of other companies had a very uh, much similar story that you're just telling, uh, reward competence, reward uh, results, top 15% get, you know, bonus, lower 15% fired, <laughs> sucks, and in yeah. between, you know, you're all living in fear. And what were they doing? They had one of the most corrupt company cultures ever. And by the way, they were loved by the McKinsey's and all other consulting companies. They were loved by them and they were stuffed by McKinsey protégés, right? Yes, but but but, um, but again, we're falling into the trap of saying because it's not perfect, it's it, 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 it's bad, it doesn't work. And, that, and that's just not true. I mean, Enron was a disaster. I mean, I, t I tell the story of Enron in the status game. Um, the, the point is they weren't um, they were rewarding competence. They were, they were rewarding corruption. You know, they weren't running their company as they, as they were supposed to be. They were, you know, they were engineering, um, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were conspiring to create power cuts in order to, uh, is my understanding, my, my memory California. of the, of the book. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. so that, that's, not, that's not competence. <laughs> that's corruption. Um, but, but also, you know, like, again, you can't fall into the trap of saying because, because sometimes it fails. It just doesn't work and it's just not, it, it doesn't matter. That, that to me is the simplistic um, is is the simplistic idea, you know? You know that's the story. You know, again, you know, you know, again to say it's an incredibly complex system, and it's always going to have good effects and bad effects. I mean, one bad effect of the success game era is that is that we 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 reward sociopaths. I mean, to become a leader of a company like Enron, or even a company that isn't you know is, isn't criminally corrupt. People that rise to the top of those hierarchies are psych you know, that we're not psychos. That's that, that, that's going too far. But 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 you know, they're not ordinary people. They're people that want to win at any they're cost. They're very narcissistic and, so, yeah. and they have certain conscious or subconscious tendencies that are character tendencies that are have psychological dimensions to them. Completely. And, that, and and that's one of the flaws of well, the success game, but also the virtue game. I mean, you know, um Karl Marx was uh, playing a virtue game and he was you know, Lenin was a was a psychopath by my by my estimation. That's very much a, a, was a virtue game. So so so, so yeah. I mean, it's um you, you know uh, there's I would never make an argument that 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 that, that, that there's been a perfect that, that 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 modernity is perfect or religion is perfect. They're, they're complex systems, you know, and and you know and and you know the storytelling brain always wants to simplify always wants to see the world in terms of heroes and villains and, and perfect success and perfect failure but that isn't reality the reality is messy um and and yes yeah, so, 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 so that, that's what i'd say to that sure yeah and because of the fact that reality is messy and and it's we need a context to make out of the mess we need to import a framework from the outside within which we must judge reality and therefore, reality as itself could be a fact, but whether it's up or down, good or bad, left or right, it's a matter of the framework within which we look at, at it from, right? And that's the story. So in other words, you have the reality, but the way we judge the reality is through, through the story within which we're looking at reality. And the same applies to status, right? So yeah. let's say I can have a story of living in a village in Africa where, you know, my greatest dream is to have a donkey cart. 
Now, if I have a donkey cart, I may be the luckiest and happiest man in the world. But I live here in Toronto, and let's say, my, not that that's the case, but let's say my dream is to have a Tesla plate model. Uh, you know, and someone comes and gives me a donkey cart. I would find that probably insulting or ridiculous or would make me miserable, etc. It's the same donkey cart, but one person looks at it as a fortune, as the happiest thing that happened to them. And by the way, in that village where that person lives, having a donkey cart would put him up there on the status uh, level, you know, because maybe he would be the mayor, maybe he would open up his business, maybe he would get married younger because he already is ahead of his, you know, competitors for 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 a young wife or something like that. And so the status is not really... A, a, the, the, the donkey cart may be a scientific fact, but whether it's up or down, how much it matters is all about the story, is what totally. I'm trying to say. Yeah, that, that's 100% correct. Yeah, that's the storytelling brain. So, um, you know, in the subconscious, sometimes um, researchers call it the status detection system. You know, we've got, this, we've got this very highly attuned status detection system that's constantly scanning our environment, trying to work out where we are on the pecking order. So we're very, you know, so we, and, 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 and we judge it symbolically. So in the book, I write about studies which show that people become, humans be, can become extremely preoccupied with the relative amount of orange juice that's poured in their glass. Like if you if you pour a bunch of glasses of orange juice and then you get less, you're really annoyed in that. <laughs> it's not a mouthful of orange juice. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marker of your status. So we are obsessional about these about these markers, and we tell stories about them. But 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 the re what's really going on? Like you know, if you if you were the donkey cart person, you you'd be telling all these stories. But I I deserve the, the Tesla because you know you have all these stories, all these stories, all these stories. Um, um, but but yeah, the, the the truth is that that, you, that, that that it's simply your unconscious brain seeing that as a as a reduced mark of your status. So you're 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 you're, you're kind of furious about it. So yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's that's where the the storytelling brain intersects with you know the, the, the subconscious brain. It's um you know we, 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 all this stuff. You know, in, in the book I talk about um you know it it, it runs you a bit about religion. I write about um an anthropologist went to a West African country, um, a place called uh, the city called Kitsumara in the 70s, and, uh, and was trying to work out why Islam, radical Islam, was spreading in that in, in that part of the world. And um, it, it was particularly mysterious because it used to be a kind of a royal um, republic. Royal republic? No, a royal. There used to be a, a royalty and aristocracy there. And the, the Islamists came in and just basically destroyed it all and took over. And the former noblemen, um, some of them were going to Islam, and he was like, "Why is this? Because they should be the enemy." And 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 he he found two you know people from noble families who who were living in drastically reduced circumstances, and one of them had, had embraced Islam and and uh, and and was working really hard and was you know memorizing the Quran and going through their various um, um, you know rituals and uh, uh, you know when you when you when you reach a certain age you 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 you, you reach a certain kind of level of status in the in in the kind of the game of of Islam as it were, um, and he was proud, happy, um, uh, you know, had wives who was successful, and then there was this other guy who was a peanut seller, and he, and he was miserable, and you know, and he, he just he, he was just miserable and stooped. His body language was terrible. His wife hated him. Uh, his his best friend said, "Oh, it's his nobleman's heart. He just can't cope with being a peanut seller." And this guy Barco, he said, Jerome Barco, he said, you know. He didn't use the phrase the status game. That, that, that was my thing. But like, but he, but he said that, you know, that, 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 that Islam was, was offering this, he got this criteria for claiming status that, 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 that was functional. So, so, and so, uh, whereas peanut selling isn't a, isn't a good criteria for claiming status. So, 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 so it was having this transformative effect on his life. So all this stuff that he was describing, the memorizing the Quran, the going through these rituals, I mean, as, as an atheist, to me, it's just, it's just, it, 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 it's, Complete fabrication. It's a total story. It's it's the creation of you know connected imaginations have come up with this stuff. It doesn't exist. Um, but 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 um, this individual believed in that story wholeheartedly, and by believing in that story, he began to believe in his own status, and it transformed his life. He was a happy, successful, sure. thriving person because he believed that story. So 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 yeah, that's how that that's how. Yeah, I mean, it's just a way of saying you're, yeah, I completely agree with you. That's yeah, we 
we tell a story about stuff, but what's really going underneath the hood is it's just status. But that's, but that's why the science is secondary, right? So, so look at it this way. I'll give you three examples. First example is when my wife was seven years old, she had a, a, a wart on her hand and the doctors tried to burn it, tried to do all kinds of stuff to it. And then the result was she got warts on her other hand. So now she has warts on both hands and a year after treatment, no result. Finally, the doctor told her mom, we have these new amazing injections, but your daughter needs to come here for six months and get a shot in her bum every month. And then they'll take care of it. They're brand new, they're amazing. So they started going every month for these shots. Boom, four months, not even six months, four months later, all the warts are gone. And so my mother-in-law asked the doctor, so doctor, what's the, what's the, this kind of miracle drug you're giving my daughter? And he said, oh, that drug, it's called placebo, <laughs> right? So what's a placebo? Placebo is a story. Yes. It's a story about a drug you, you thought you took, but you never did. And yet you have a scientifically measurable effects, positive yes. effects anywhere from 30 to in some cases up to 50 people, 50% uh, of the people who get placebo can get measurable positive or effects or improvement. Right, mm. so we have the story becoming the science, right? That's what a placebo is, placebo is a story. And, and so in other words, to take that one step further, science without story is meaningless because you can't make any meaning without the context. That's why Toni Morrison, the Pulitzer Prize winning author said, quote, facts can exist without human intelligence, but truth cannot. Yeah, Albert Einstein himself once said that there are no facts without theory. And what's a theory? A theory is simply a story. So he says there is no such thing as facts without a theory. Okay, but so the so, theory so, so, is a story. So, 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 so there, there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. Where's the story in that? So the story is what is a millimeter? And the story is so what? Let's say, let's say you're Russia and I'm Ukraine yeah. and you say, look, the fact of the matter is we have one kilometer border between us. That's a scientific fact. I'm Ukraine. Yeah. I say, look, this is plenty enough. It's one kilometer. You're safe. I'm safe. Mm. You're Russia. You're Putin. And you say, and by the way, that's where status comes to play again, of course. Mm because that's a story at another level, I would argue again. He looks at that one kilometer, which is a scientific fact, and he says, no, we are very unsafe. And as he said on TV two days ago, Russians will not neg negotiate about their safety. So yeah, yeah. he finds that highly unsafe. The one kilometer is a scientific fact, but what it means is mm. meaningless without the context. Mm. Right? You need the context. Otherwise, you don't know. Think about breaking the atom. We have the physics about the atom. We have the physics of how it works. But you need a story to make an atomic power plant or an atomic bomb. And you have the same science, two diametrically opposed stories. And so it is not the atom or the science mm. that makes the difference. It's the story of how you look at it and what do you think it's useful for and how you should or you shouldn't be using it. And of course, you can find people embracing both stories. That's why we have both nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons today. Yeah. And yeah, so, so, so the story gives the purpose and the meaning. Is that what you're arguing? I am arguing... The facts, the, the facts exist independently of the... The facts exist independently of the story, but the story gives it meaning. They're meaningless. So whether we call it truth or theory, we need a story to put those facts into context, to be yeah. able to see them in perspective, to rank and organize them, because how you prioritize and sift information depends on your value system. Yes, and value yes. system is outside. So to make sense of the science and to align, to give value to it, you need a story. And so science without story has no agenda, no priorities, no meaning, 
yeah. no direction, no value, and mm. no use. Because all of those come from the story. None mm. of them come from the science. None. Mm. Even the point of investigating this problem versus that problem, which could be a scientific issue, and is a scientific issue, but how you rank and organize which problem you should you should solve first is a story framed decision. And, yeah. and the yeah. value of each problem's solving is outside of the problem itself. Yeah. Therefore, outside of the science. And therefore, it's not that the science is independent, but it's entirely dependent on the story because it cannot happen outside of the context. Think about it like quantum mechanics. You have the observer effect in quantum mechanics, which means that an observer is not an independent of the system that is being observed. So you can have the direction, but you can't have uh, the speed or the location. You can have one measurement, but not another. And the, an art, a particle can be here or could be there, but the moment you measure it, you change the system. And so you have the so-called observer effect. So you, you're not independent. And unfortunately, that's how science works. Science works within our sort of, a, for a lack of better world, uh, species level kind of a story, or even at the individual level. You know, I've interviewed 300 scientists, each of them, I ask them, so why did you become scientist? And everyone tells me their story. Mm -hmm. But that story came first. The science came later. And that's the reason why they're doing the science and trying to do what they're trying to do. Yeah, 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 that's fascinating. Okay, so uh, I, I mean, I find this conversation very, very interesting and very engaging, even though, to be honest, as I shared with you before the interview started, I'm highly depressed by the war in Ukraine right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, and it's I'm terrible. Very concerned. But in a way, though, Putin is playing the status game that you're talking about now, right? So from his point of view, uh, and you talk about the fact that in your book, humiliation is annihilation of the self. Well, from Putin's point of view, Russia has been humiliated. Yes. He has been humiliated globally and has been unjustly treated by the West. And he gave us this whole speech the other day on TV. And so, therefore, he is justified in taking the actions that he's taking in uh, the Ukraine. And uh, uh, Jonas Sachs talks about the story wars. Each war is first and foremost a story war because the story about the war sets up who is the villain and who is the hero. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's right about humiliation. I mean, one of the, we you know when I start, when I was first thinking about writing about status, I wanted to, uh, you know, one of the tests I kind of set myself was I was thinking, well, if you're going to argue that status is so important, it must be pretty bad when, uh, when we're deprived of status, like, you know, so, so, so check that out and, and see, and, and that's the test, you know? And so that's when I came across up on the literature of, uh, on humiliation. And it was, it was just unbelievable. And I still remember reading the paper on, on, you know, on, on the train, just thinking in my mind was, I just could not believe what I was reading. So state, it's a humiliation is defined as it's not just the removal of your status. It's the removal of your status from your group and uh, 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 with the, with the inability to claim it ever again in the future. It's like, you just feel like I can never, they're never going to value me ever again. And I just need to, you know, get out of here. So, 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 so you know, being a state is so incredibly important to us as a, uh, as, as an animal, um, that, 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 that serious um, and public removal of it is incredibly painful. And, you know, what convinced me was, was seeing that humiliation is, is, is implicated deeply in the worst of human behaviors in um, serial killers, in spree killers, in honor killers, um, in terrorism, um, and even genocide. Um, um, uh, and, you know, one of the researchers that I quote in the book says that um, the most potent weapon of mass destruction is the humiliated mind. And that was very much, you know, in my thoughts over the last few days as, you know, watching Putin. You know, you forget when you see these great geopolitical events like the invasion of you know, Ukraine, you know, you, you know, what's going on with China and Taiwan at the moment. You forget that all this begins um, in the minds of humans, all this stuff. 
and you know the humiliated leader i mean you know the other thing that the other the other argument i make in the book is that is that people are humans are especially dangerous when they meet three um when, when, when they meet you know three conditions the first one being they're humiliated the second one being they're male you know because men are just much more aggressive than women that's just the truth and the, and the third that they're narcissistic because narcissistic people have a long way to fall narcissistic people um go around the world thinking i am auto my, my you know i don't have to earn my status i'm they, amazing they have a status entitlement complex perhaps exactly that's exact perfectly put and and so when you humiliate a male narcissist it is you know it's a recipe for chaos and violence and and, and madness and you know and you know what are xi jinping what what is putin but, you know that 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 they're, they're certainly narcissistic to get where they are they sure. are narcissistic um sure. and, and you know and that's the danger also with taiwan is that it is that the more that xi jinping flirts with the taking of taiwan and the more pushback he feels from the west the more humiliated he's going to feel in the eyes of his people and the more humiliated he feels the more he's going to want to you know and it could very easily come to a tipping point where he's like fuck this i'm taking it because i you know i'm not letting I'm not being pushed around by these but by these you know westerners yeah and, and especially since he also feels like china has been humiliated by the thousands to commit uh mass destruction to commit genocide right so you need the story of the jew as the villain so for hitler to do his stuff so maybe he was humiliated maybe germany was humiliated But again, yes, of course. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. But the but the mind is a storyteller, so you can't separate the mind from the storyteller. I completely agree with you. But uh, you know, um, so, so yeah. I mean, in, and in the status game, there's a chapter on the rise of the Nazis and and the stories that they told, um, and that's very much you know Germany was it was it was the archetypal humiliated nation after World War One, and they told a story. Um, but 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 um, I also tell the story of it uh, of, of a spree killer, Elliot Rogers, who um, was a misogynist and. Um, told a story about the world in which um women were the cause of all the problems in the world because they kept marrying and procreating with violent idiots and so so the solution was to just destroy all women uh, kill them all and abolish sex i mean you know and they ended up um you know taking a a a a a, 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 a gun and killing a bunch of um people in santa barbara so so so, so yeah i mean mass destruction not not mass but 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 yeah but 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 the humiliated narcissist you know it doesn't need lots of people to become extremely dangerous ted bundy um was another one i also tell the story but of the isn't Uthabola. humiliation a story Is sorry ted kaczynski um sure. yeah yes yes yeah yes yes yeah you well, you feel humiliated and you tell a story about that humiliation but what you tend to do is it, what, what, certainly what the narcissist tends to do, and probably most of us, is to tell a story that we didn't deserve that, that's out of order. And actually, the people that have humiliated me, they're the villains. I'm the good guy, they're the villains. And in fact, when um, Elliot Rogers, the, 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 the day before he did his mass killing, he uploaded his autobiography to the, to the internet. It was 108,000 word autobiography called My Twisted World. And in the final paragraph, he says, I'm the good guy. He actually says that, I am the good guy. You know, you, you guys have got this coming. So, 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 so that that's the story, you know. That's the story, and you're right. It requires the story to give meaning to the action of, of humiliation. And Epictetus, mm. one of my favorite Stoic philosophers, he says, and this goes back to the point I made for earlier about science. It is not the events in our life; it is the stories that we attach to them. So, a scientifically verifiable factual event happens to you. That's a fact. But what it means, whether it's good or bad, yes. depends on the story that you attach to that fact. And so some this, people yes. and, and yeah. that's where and and by the way, Viktor Frankl talks a lot about that in logotherapy. He says that that's where our realm of freedom lies between uh input and response. He says there lies a space. And within that space is where our freedom lies. And hmm. another way of, of, of saying it is something factual happens to you, like in the case of that mass murderer or in the case of Putin. But the story we choose to attach consciously or subconsciously 
is where our freedom of choice lies. So we can embrace the first story that comes to our mind and we can say, I feel humiliated. Russia is humiliated and we don't negotiate with Russian security issues. Or you can look deeper and choose to attach a different story. So Epictetus was a slave in Rome for more than 30 years. That's a pretty dreadful factual story, right? It did happen to him. He was a, a slave. He had such a terrible master who beat him once so badly that he snapped his leg and Epictetus had a limp in his leg for the rest of his life. We even don't know the guy's name. So Epictetus means the acquired one. That's all he, we know about him, the acquired one. And yet he wrote a book called The Manual for Living, where he talks about in his manual how we can take, as Shakespeare said, the slings and arrows that come at us. That's what resilience is all about. And that's where the freedom comes, because Epictetus chose a different story to attach to his slavery. He was free because Victor Franco chose a different story to attach to his own slavery and his own time in the camps in Nazi Germany, he was mentally different and as free as possible within the confines and his absolutely dreadful context of, of survival for three years or so. But we still have that freedom to choose that story. So what I'm trying to say is that Humiliation is a story and we can choose to embrace it or not. Just like victimhood, by the way. That's not to depreciate the idea that victims are victims and they're factual crimes and suffering enforced on them. But simply to point out the fact that Stoic philosophy and even Buddhism have pointed out for thousands of years, and that is that for as long as you're holding on to the story of victimhood, you would never be free. And freedom, and by the way, this is what uh, psychotherapy is all about. Psychotherapy is about changing the story in your mind about who is in charge of your story. Not denying the facts that happened of your life, the abuse that happened, and all the problems that you have had, but putting you in charge of that story and saying, okay, this is what happens, it's a fact, I can change it, but I choose a different story about whether I feel humiliated or not. And a Stoic philosopher would say that humiliation doesn't exist. A Stoic philosopher says, and the reason for that is because there is only one self-respect, one kind of respect, and that's self-respect. So if others don't respect you, that's okay. Diogenes uh, uh, of Sinope, he was uh, sun tanning, and Alexander the Great came with, to him on his horse and looked down at him, and you know, Alexander was this greatest warrior the world has ever seen, conquered half the world, if not the entire known world, and because he respected Diogenes so much, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? I am Alexander the Great. And Diogenes, who was sun tanning, looked up and said, move to the side, you're blocking the sun. That was his response to Alexander, right? So. In other words, it's all about the story within which we decide to perceive the world. That's my conclusion. And, and I am happy that you're challenging me because that's making me learn and think so much. And, and I'm appreciate. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense with one small caveat. I, I, I'm skeptical about people who say they don't care what anybody thinks about themselves. I only care what I think about me because it contradicts our human nature. We are a social animal. We, we, we have evolved in a tribal context. And for me, the, the only people that I will believe that they generally don't care what other people think are people who are se severely mentally ill. Um, you, you know, th there's this concept of the looking glass self. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think other people think I am. That's kind of how it works. We look at other people to find out who we are. Am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Am I too excitable? Do I talk too much? Have I got bad breath? Da -da 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 -da. That's how we find out who we are through the eyes of other people. And, and I think, you know, I, I know the Stoics had lots of very noble, um, you know, aphorisms and sayings and, and you know, a lot of wisdom packed, packed into that. But, but um, 
and, and certainly it's a noble ideal to strive for, to care less about what other people think about you. But but I think in in reality, unless you're mentally ill, it's just not possible. You, you know, you're not going to stop caring what other people think about you. There, there was an interesting study um, in the in the Netherlands where they, they they studied people who did mindfulness meditation, and the purpose of their mindfulness meditation was to, to reduce the ego, to stop caring about success and what other people thought about them. Um, and they found that these people scored very highly in what they called spiritual superiority. You know, they they actually became really proud of themselves that they were mindfulness meditators. And, they were, and you know, they, they cared, that they, they wanted other people to know that they were mindfulness meditators. And they, and they, they, were, they were answering, that they were saying things like, the world would be a much better place if everybody had the insights that I have about the world. So that's, you know, and so that's human nature. So, 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 that's, so, so yeah, I, I agree that it's a noble, it's a noble thing to strive for. And I agree that, 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 we, that we, we, we could all with doing, with caring a bit less, a bit, or being less, pre, less preoccupied and ruminating less while people think about us. But I do think ultimately it's not possible because it, it contradicts hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution. Yeah, and, and uh, the idea is not to be a topic about it and or extremist, but to choose a few chosen people whose opinion matters more and not, uh, I think it was, I forget if it's Cicero or Seneca who said, why do you care about the perception? Uh, no, why do you care about the estimate that other people give you with respect to people who don't have very high estimate of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. or something to that effect. I'm butchering the yeah. quote, but it's basically, yeah. why do you care about people's opinion who do you don't care about? Like, so you, so it's a little more sophisticated. It's not about, I don't care about anyone. Obviously that's kind of a psycho, you know, there's psychological mm -hmm. issues there, but it's about choosing the people and the teachers or the role models you, you choose. And by the way, uh, like Socrates did, paying the price for when you make those choices, uh, right? So yeah, I, I also I, I reminded of that great quote. I think it might have been Winston Churchill. It was someone like that who said, "If you haven't made enemies by the time you're you know thirty or thirty five, you've not been living a proper life." And I think that's true as well. It's, you know, I, I remember I remember thinking that and thinking, you know, that's that, that, that that's a really profound thing to say. Like if you're actually doing something with your life and making a difference and achieving things. You know what? Some people are not going to like you. You're going to have made enemies, and some people are going to. So, so, so I, I think that kind of you know reflects your your point about being smarter about whose opinion we care about, and actually having the courage to realize that if we have made enemies, it, it, it might not be because we're terrible people when we've done terrible things. It might be because we're making a difference and, and we're actually living a meaningful life. And also to be fine with the fact that there is a price to be paid, and that we should be okay with, you know, if we have to pay the price, like Socrates did, we should be okay that one comes with the other. So uh, whether Socrates was right or wrong, he had the option to walk away and live his life, and yet he decided to uh, stay and be executed by his compatriots. <laughs> So, yes. so, yeah. so yeah. there is a price for for that. But let me see if I can bring back our conversation to some kind of a sort of a more traditional conversation that we're having here, usually on my podcast. Because mm. today I feel like I'm all over the place, and it's not your fault. You have many brilliant books that are <laughs> worth reading. It's probably my mental state and psychological yeah. state right now with everything that's happening. So. Tell me a bit something of like the connection between story and technology. And I'll give mm. you perhaps a context and you can accept or deny it. Seth Godin says that Facebook and Twitter are not a triumph of technology, but are a triumph of storytelling. Mm. Mm. I, I'm a big fan of Seth Godin. I think he's a brilliant writer. That, that, that idea, I'm not quite clear about. So, so, so I'll tell you. You know, I wrote about this a book, Selfie, about technology, and lots of that was about the about te well, Selfie was about technology and the self. And so, so I'll give you in a nutshell what what I think about that. And that's that actually these what these technologists are doing are by trial and instinct and error, working out what what humans want and giving it to them. I think it, again, it goes back to that storytelling brain. We, we look out of the world and we want to see villains and heroes. 
And so, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, perfect villains. We, we make villains of them. And the story that we tell is that they, um, th that they've corrupted the world with their awful kind of technologies. Uh, but actually, I don't think that's the, that that's true. So, 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 so in in the case of the selfie camera, which is the story that I tell in selfie, you know, when the selfie camera was launched. It wasn't launched as a selfie camera. It was called the front-facing camera. And, you know, Sony and then Apple, you know, um, after Sony, you know, they, they envisaged that was going to be a technology for having business meetings um, or, 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 you know, talking to your nan. It, it, they, 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 nobody imagined that what, that, that, that what we would do with a selfie camera, um, you know, a lot of the time is point at ourselves and take pictures of ourselves. That didn't occur to anyone at Sony or Apple or anywhere else. And it was only once we started doing it billions of times a day um, that, 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 you know, that, that, that they started morphing and changing that technology to, to create better selfie cameras. And it's the same with social media. So, so, so people blame Twitter and Facebook for, you know, tribalism, partisanship, um, cancel culture, all of that stuff. And it's just not true. In, in the status game, I tell the story of the very first social media website as we know it. It was called The Well, um, the Whole Earth Electronic Link. Are you quoted? Um, it, what's his name? The, 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 the Whole Earth Brand. guy. Brand. Yeah, it's him. Was, he, he was behind it. Uh, yeah. And, um, and in 1985, when there was about 500 members, this was still when you had to go into the internet, you had to put your phone on a modem and all that and dial in. It was a bit like Reddit, where they had these little groups that you would talk around. This troll came in, this guy Mark Ethan Smith, and just started attacking all the men, um, you know, with all these kind of very, very kind of politically charged feminist anti-male arguments. Um, became hugely unpopular, um, was mobbed and cancelled, and had their work removed. Um, you know, the, 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 they were even arguing about pronouns in 1985 on, on social media. So, 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 so it's just what happens when you connect people together. They, they, they play for status with dominance, with virtue, success. They have arguments. They go tribal because we're a tribal animal. And so, 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 so that's what I think um, about technology. It, it, you know, it, I, I think, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ramification of that storytelling brain that we see the 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 the, the technologists like Zuckerberg as these as these villains and actually what they I mean you know I'm not saying they they're they're saints that's that's equally naive all, all all they're trying to do all they're doing is by instinct and iteration and you know focus is is, is they're working out what what humans want and in the in the case of social media what humans want is to play status games and if you go onto Twitter that's what you see you see dominance virtue and success. You see people pushing each other around, showing off their virtuous behaviors and beliefs and showing off their achievements. And that's basically it, isn't it? I mean, that's human life. So, 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 so that's my, um, you know, that's, that, that's, that, that's my take on technology in a nutshell from selfie and then the status. Yeah. Mm. I, I have to disagree with you on that one. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that <laughs> it kind of, removes the responsibility of the actor. You're saying, okay, this is uh, human nature. We're all playing status game for tens of thousands of years since the beginning of humanity. It's nothing new. They're just doing the same thing in a different medium. Well, I would say yeah. that being true, here's the problem. First, a quote from Sean Parker. This is what Sean Parker said publicly, the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little bit of dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop. Exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. The inventors, creators, it's me, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's Kevin Systrom of Instagram, it's all of these people understood these consciously and we did it anyway. So to me, this is like the guy, and I'm trying to remember the name of the company, was it Purdue Pharma or who was the creator of fentanyl? You know, they created fentanyl. They manufactured this huge 
epidemic of drug consumption and large-scale deaths and destruction and crime rates jumps due to the drug consumption in the United States and even in, in parts of Canada and all over the world, even in some places. And you could say, look, we're just a manufacturer of drugs. We're giving people what we, they want. We are, don't, look, this is evolution. This is biology of the human brain. We're just giving people what we want. Don't look at us, look at biology. It's not our fault. To me, it seems like you're making a similar argument because to uh, me, those yeah. people did a deliberate choice of how to employ technology towards what purposes and how to short circuit our brains and exploit the weaknesses of our biological wiring. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, I think you've misunderstood me slightly. Like I tell the story in the status game that, that you describe, but I tell the story of BJ Fogg and his and his idea, the, 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 the persuasive technology lab at Stanford, yeah. where he where, where he he theorized in 2003, he predicted brilliantly the invention of the smart of the iPhone. He describes it perfectly in 2003 as a device smaller than a deck of cards that does all these things. Amazing. And, and, and he posits that in order to make it, um, com, you know, compulsive, addictive and, and kind of something that, that, that is, of, or, you know, that, that is able to persuade people that, that, that you would need to give these inconsistent rewards, right, like a slot machine. And, and that's what we do. And, and then I take that just a slight step further in the status game. And I, and I say, OK, so it's a slot machine. But, w- but what, are you, what currency are you putting in? Well, it's status, is you know, and so the chapter is called the slot machine for status. That's what we do when we play to, when we contribute to social media. We make a comment, you know, you, you know, we 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 you know when we we tweet a podcast, we we you know we 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 put a picture up and we look for the likes. How many have I got? How many have I got? You go up and down and up and down and up and down with your status. So 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 I'm not saying um that they that, that, that they have no responsibility for this. Uh, it, it, um in fact I in the book I argue that they do and and and, and there is a certain deliberation you know, they are deliberately I, I, I didn't use the Sean Parker quote but there's a similar quote by somebody else at Facebook saying that we want to psychologically manipulate you as much as possible or something like that. Um, what I'm saying is they didn't create the behaviors. So it's, it's, so 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 in selfie I was taking I was taking on the argument that would you don't hear it quite so much now because we've moved on from selfie and narcissism but 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 the iPhone has created these narcissists, and it's like uh, what I'm saying is they haven't created it; they're feeding it. Um, and, and now we hear that Twitter and Facebook create cancel culture. And what I'm saying is they encourage it; they do encourage it. That they don't help absolutely, um, and they are responsible for um, feeding that machine and profiting off that machine. But they don't create the behaviour. You know, b- before the advent of social media back in the '90s. All the tech utopians at Wired magazine and stuff were predicting that when social media happens, when everyone's connected, it's going to be a utopia. All the old hierarchies are going to get knocked down. It's going to be this blissful world of freedom of speech. And that's what I'm saying is wrong. That ain't true. And it's not Twitter's fault that that's not true, because that's what people are like. But yes, I agree with you. Um, And the argument, and I make that precise argument in the status game, is that they've encouraged it cynically and they profit from it and and they have responsibility for yeah for 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 throwing you know oil in the fire yeah because to me you say also that things like warmth sincerity and competence are probably the best way to play the status game so we can choose to create games that reward that kind of behavior that incentivize that kind of behavior and yet those people didn't so it's like you know putin saying look it's in the human nature uh, to kill each other. It's our nature that one human kills another human. So I'm going to create this environment right now. You know, humans are killers. It's not my fault. But I'm going to create right now this yeah. environment in which a large scale of humans are going to kill another large group of humans. And I'm going to give them all kinds of ridiculously powerful weapons to amplify that effect go take it exponential as they like to mm. to call mm. it in silicon valley and and mm. have accelerating returns uh, uh, uh of the scale of damage but that's not my fault you know so all i'm saying is and i'm not saying it's your fault or and i think we have agreement there in the center is mm. that they do have responsibility and it's just the difference yeah i agree yeah. No, I do. They, I, they do have responsibility. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, but I'm just yeah. It's it, it's it's a nuance. I'm just saying that sometimes you hear that they create the behavior from scratch. That if it wasn't for Twitter, we wouldn't be 
the kind of creatures that would argue about beliefs and try and cancel each other. And what I'm saying is we are actually, but but I agree with you that, that the, these companies are cynically profiting from that and they are the equivalent of Putin saying, well, you, you know, giving weapons to violent people. Yeah, I, I think we're in agreement. And BJ Fox bears personal, I mean, BJ Fogg bears personal responsibility, okay? Because his students came up with Instagram his students came up with the like button. His students came up with some of the most kind of biologically hacking, undermining behaviors that are utilized in social media today. And that was the name of his lab was the, what is it? The center of persuasive. For... I think it's persuasive technologies lab, something like right. that. Right. But, but that yeah. changed. It used to have a different name originally, by the way. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, also he actually had very little to say about uh, ethics and stuff like that originally. And only under, under a lot of pressure did he start having a little bit of an ethical implications discussion and stuff like that. So I think really? he, he personally, uh, bears responsibility. I mean, so when you teach people all kinds of tools, like for example, in martial arts, when you teach people to fight, presumably one of the, the most important lessons is to teach them to avoid fighting as much as possible, to, to be nonviolent, to be patient, etc. right? He skipped that part entirely. All, <laughs> all he focused on was the science, the pure science of how the brain works, and what we can do to make it do this thing rather than that thing. In other words, to manipulate it, just like, you know, the slot machines in the casinos in Las Vegas, with the same kind of algorithm that feeds you just enough reward so that you keep playing the slots, the same mm -hmm. algorithm is, is used in social media. And those were his students. Right? Yes, so, yeah, and, and I think his genius, like his dark genius, was this, is the inconsistent rewards. Sometimes you get a lot. Sometimes you get nothing. Sometimes you get, uh, and and so and and that's what makes it compulsive. And he, and and you're right. I mean, in his, his, you can still buy his book from 2003, and, and he's very clear in that that the, 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 his proposal that that this is like a slot machine is is compulsive, becomes almost addictive. This is what we can do with these with these mobile with these smart, smartphones that are on the way, and 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 this is what this is what has happened. So 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 yeah. I mean, he's I, I agree. You know, he is. Um, He's quite, he, I don't want to say aggressive, he, 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 he's quite forthright in defending himself, saying, oh, no, I always warned, I always warned people that, that, that this could be used for bad as well as good. But but, but I think, it, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, he, he's certainly one of the architects of um, the kind of smartphone craziness that we, that we see today. Well, Will, we've been having kind of a heated discussion here for the last uh, hour and 40 minutes or so, give or take. Now, let me ask you this. You've talked to me now for that amount of time. Is my thesis completely wrong? Is my thesis that, uh, and, and maybe I wasn't clear about what my thesis is in, in my book. And, but basically, my, my book uh, is called Rewriting the Human Story, How Our mm -hmm. Story Determines Our Future. And, you know, I already had the thesis when I uh, read uh, Jonah Sachs's book where he talks about the myth gaps. I already had kind of seen that basically our world is falling apart right now at the storytelling level because all of our institutions about what is democracy and how it works, democracy is a kind of story. Just like monarchism was a story that ruled us or humanity cooperated under for thousands upon thousands of years, which then replaced was was replaced with democracy. Now it would appear that in the 21st century, the story of capitalism, the story of democracy, they're all kind of falling apart and cracking because those stories which gave us, uh, informed our decisions about how to deal with our crises in the past are no longer suited to the problems we're facing today. And so we have this gap that he calls the myth gap, I just call it a gap. And mm. so my thesis is that we are at a point where we need to, to rewrite the human story again. Yeah. The human story has been written and rewritten several times in the past. One time I said that the most recent time that it's been rewritten was around the Industrial Revolution or the Enlightenment mm -hmm. 
period. That's the last time. Mm -hmm. And it has taken us thus far. And it has sent us to the moon and to Mars. Mm -hmm. And it has increased uh, standard of living, as you pointed out, and we have many accomplishments to be proud of. At the same time, it looks like we're also headed towards self-destruction at so many levels. We mm -hmm. have soil erosion, climate change, species extinction, potential of mm -hmm. nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, global pandemics, which are all self-caused problems. Mm -hmm. And the way we solve problems, or at least perceive them, is through the stories within which we contextualize those problems. And right now, we don't seem to have a coherent story that would bring large enough number of us together to cooperate towards the resolution of these problems. So we have the science about climate change, which is absolutely mm. solid. It's in It's like undebatable at this point. And yet people with different stories, stories which don't allow that evidence to play the, the way it plays in our story, they deny that because it doesn't fit within their story. So instead of arguing with them about the evidence, we need to either find how to bring evidence within their story or how to change their story so that they can look at the same old evidence in a different new light and therefore mm. take a new type of an action. And so that's kind of like my setup for my book. That's the problem. And then mm. my thesis is we need a new story, a new story that can bring sufficiently large number of humans together so that we can solve issues like climate change, nuclear proliferation, soil erosion, species extinction, ocean acidification, even artificial intelligence and you know genetic engineering, you name it. And I say that, and, and I originally used to thought to think many years ago that that potential new story could be transhumanism. But ah, then, okay. then I got to the I, I denied that, which is why I was kind of ostracized from the transhumanist community, because I got to the conclusion that's a rehashing of the same old humanist story. It's no, it's not okay. a different story. And it's kind of this very teleological, self-serving, narcissistic story in a way of, you know, us becoming gods, ultimately. That's what mm. transhumanism and humanism is about, really. So anyway... Am I completely out of line and totally out for lunch and totally making no sense? And so I'm no, looking uh, for that story. So my book is divided in three parts. First, what is story? Second, yeah. how what is the human story that brought us this way here? And thirdly, what should be or could be the future story that brings us through the 21st century? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with you that we're in a crisis, crisis of stories. I, I don't see anything wrong with that, with that thesis whatsoever. I, you know, I, 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 I do. I, I, you know, I, you know, one of the thi one of the reasons, one of the things I've never really written about it, but I, you know, I, I, I've thought about it a lot. Is I think that the, the stories that the generations live through, they don't last for long enough. So, 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 I, my grandparents' generation fought in the Second World War. And to have this visceral, um, this visceral memory of the importance of freedom and democracy and Western um, ideals, um, my parents' generation, you know, fought the civil rights movement. You know, for, for, say, so especially in America, you know, for, for freedom of speech, and they were they were the freedom of speech rights, and then that's kind of been forgotten. And I th and I think um, so, so. I think those stories were front and center in the minds of those generations. Freedom of speech freedom of democracy, you know, against tyranny, against fascism. And my generation and the young, you know, gener the Gen Zs and millennials, the, the further you get from people who have viscerally lived through those stories, the less they believe them. And they become very cynical about um, democracy. They become very cynical about freedom of speech. And that, that to me, is the worry, that, 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 that in order to keep people caring about these stories and um, ide actively identified with these stories, you've actually got to push them through it a little bit and show them the ramifications of what happens if we fail. I mean, you know, I, I, I've always been a left-wing person, um, but writing the status game and actually force, you know, making myself look through the history of modernity, look through the West's contribution to civilization, the fact that Western, that, that, that human rights itself is an idea that comes out of Western individualism. You know, I, I had to confront a lot of my stupid 
stories about how the West is the villain and the West is terrible and we're just colonizers and you know rapists of other countries that you know we've done terrible things in the West but we've done incredible things too uh, and and I, I think we've forgotten a lot of those stories because because life has got really easy for us and we, and we, we haven't had to fight for them anymore so so yeah I, I completely agree with you uh, and it's a worry for the for, for the future of humanity if um, if it turns out indeed that to, to, to keep fighting for a set of ideals, you have to, well to keep believing a story. You have to kind of fight, be, fight for that story. It has to be in peril in some way. Um, you know, I hope that isn't true, but it kind of feels a bit true. That it feels a bit true, especially with the with the younger generation and their and, and their complete disregard. Not that's exaggeration, but they're, but but their increasing disregard for freedom of speech. I mean that 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 that's a, that, that that to me is is a reversion in, in, in kind of civilized um, ideals. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, 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 and I also, the, the, the other kind of big thing is that, is that, is that I think that um, in the West, we've stopped believing our story. You know, we, we've become so concerned with our, our wrongs for, for good, for good moral reasons. You know, we, we're worried about, you know, in America, they're worried about the history of, you know, the slave trade. In Britain, we, we worry about our history of, um, of being a colonial power and doing terrible things in India and Africa. But we become so overwhelmed with our guilt and our shame and our horror uh, that, that, that we forget what's good about us. And we forget, to, we, we forget the stories, the, the good stories, uh, uh, because they haven't forgotten that they're still telling positive stories about themselves in China. They're still telling positive stories about them, themselves in Russia. Um, but we're not telling positive stories about ourselves so much in the West anymore. And it is, I mean, you know, what you were saying about her eyes, it, it, there, there is this kind of clash of stories. Um, and and I think in the West, story we need wars. to... The story wars, yeah. We, we, I mean, we, we need to rediscover a passion for our own heroic story in the West, and especially with my people on the left. You know, like, we really need to do that. And the right need to do it in a way that isn't jingoistic and, you know, nationally, you know, and, you know, in a, in a kind of racist and all, and all those other things that can happen on the, on the, on the edges of the right. So, so yeah, I agree with you. And I, and I wonder what, what your, are you ready to say yet what your proposed solution is? Cause that's the, that's the big question, isn't it? What is the story that can. Well, I'm working on it and I may never discover it in my life, but it looks like I'm committed because I've been thinking about it for a number of years. I think I have enough material for the first two thirds of the book. Your work on storytelling, the science of storytelling was very helpful and monumental. And I have a number of references in part one, which is called story. And in part two, which is called our story, mm -hmm. I have a number of references to your books and, I, I, and I'm going to read more to use there because they're very appropriate and useful, whether it's on status, whether it's on selfie, etc. I don't have a good idea exactly on the third part about what could be that story. But what I know is that I think we desperately need them and because we need to win the story about the war about the story before we can win the war because the, the, the story tells us that we should fight. The yes. story tells us that we shouldn't accept the reality. The story tells us why we should continue, keep on going when there's all, all hope is lost. It's, it's the story a, that makes us heroic. Forget hero, heroic. Mm. It makes us do anything, right? <laughs> you can't do anything without a story about how it makes a difference, for example, or, or why you should be doing it. Otherwise, if you have a story about forget it, it's all the same, there's no hope, we might as well drink beer and watch Netflix all day long, if that's your story. And so the question is, how do you come up with a story that can mobilize sufficiently enough global people so that we can make that kind of a difference. Uh, and unfortunately, and, and it may be even totally arrogant of me to even like consider that I could be the one. But of course, my job is, my blogging name is Socrates. And Socrates was midwife to other people giving birth to their own ideas. So if I can serve that kind of function to serve other people or humanity in general, give birth to their own best ideas, I think that would be a job not bad done, perhaps. But whether I would ever be able to come up with that idea myself, pff, I don't know. All I know is I'm going to try. And all I know is that your books have been helpful for the first part one and part two of the book. 
Uh, well, I'm really glad to hear it, and I'll definitely be reading when it's published. It sounds absolutely fascinating, and um, you're obviously an incredibly smart, informed guy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I wish you all the best. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a- an amazing and worthwhile project. But it's funny how our conversation started a little bit disjointed and, and kind of uh, confrontational, and eventually, you know, we as we learn about each other and as we kind of are more open-minded about what each other's thoughts are, our ideas are, and what we stand for, we kind of start getting <laughs> our stories to, to kind of have a, a better overlap. And a great example you just gave, which also gives me an inspiration, you, you talked about human rights. Well, human rights are a literary invention, according to some people of the 18th century European novels. So mm. the idea of human rights didn't even exist as an idea. It never exists before the, the 17th or 18th century. I think it's early 18th century, like the 1700s. Novels in England, right? They came up with that idea, novelists, authors, fiction authors. And then you had this idea permeate the culture and then becoming a political slogan and political credo which made a difference in the world. So here's a perfect example of how an invented story that didn't exist, I mean, go talk about human rights in the Dark Ages or, you know, in Christianity. There is no human rights. There is only God, right? Yeah, yeah. And But then we had that idea and it was revolutionary. And so I'm thinking if we come up with another idea of that kind of a sort, because the world is changed by those stories every time. You know, the story of capitalism is, in a way, the story of denial of feudalism, right? Which allowed that the king in England became a ceremonial figurehead and a Mm. pauper or a farmer, as you said, can become a large-scale capitalist Mm. uh, or a prime minister, right? So that's the difference of the story and the story of how we should rule ourselves. We had monarchism which was, you know, the story that the king was the representative of the God, of God himself, the embodiment, the the representative of God. And now we have parliament and hopefully a prime minister which are elected, right? But those are all stories that replaced each other. It seems though, however, now that story of that prime minister and parliament is not up to the task of the problems we're facing. So Mm. we need either to tweak that story or to come up with another story of how we should cooperate the story that teaches us how to cooperate. It's like when you're playing soccer in the World Cup, you know, we disagree. Let's say you're uh, from the UK, you have a very strong team. I'm from Bulgaria. When we play soccer, we would be very strong supporters of our own teams, right? But uh, we don't take AK 47s shooting at each other. We may shout and we may wave our flags, but we embrace the story of the rules of the game of soccer. And that story has a conflict resolution mechanism within the story. So all violence is directed towards the referee and resolving peaceful, uh, the co- peacefully the conflict between our two teams. And in the end, we cooperate. So if we can, and so countries that can disagree completely on political issues can agree on the rules of the game. And the rules of the game means that there's peace in the end, right? Hopefully, despite the fact that there may be hooligans and all of that. So I'm just thinking what could be that story that could create those rules that most players on the global scheme can embrace or accept. Anyway, uh, I'm diverging digressing so will <laughs> look uh, the last two questions to you first of all where can people find more about you and your work ah oh, okay um yeah so my website is just willstore.com and you spell that um s-t-o-r-r so will store it S-T-O-R-R. and on twitter it's at w store at w-s-t-o-r-r so so that is where i am and will i always give the last words to my guests Ah. We we covered a variety of topics. We touched on several of your books, uh, namely Se- uh, Selfie, The Status Game, The Science of Storytelling, but you have three other great books too. One of them is at least a novel. So I yeah. suggest people check them out. But we covered politics, we covered storytelling, we covered so many things. 
what's the best way to send us away? What's the message that perhaps you want to send us away with? What's the best way to wrap up our conversation? The best way to wrap up our conversation? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think if there's one, um, if there's one kind of core idea that I'm always sort of arguing and pursuing in all of my books, it's it's one about forgiveness and humility. You know, you've mentioned a couple of times this, this Stuart Brand idea that we're all as gods, and and I I, I specifically take aim at that in selfie. Like we're not gods, we're animals, and the story that we tell is that we are gods. But we're not we're animals and 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 that's that's the idea that i always go back to you know like be humble and, and be forgiving of other people because we're just animals telling stories i think that's that that's that's where i'd like to leave it wow that that's great and i forget who is the author but uh she says that basically our gods are a reflection of who we are mm. so if we have angry people so for example the greek gods are all cheating, uh, adulterers, murderers, narcissists. you know, narcissists <laughs> and all, all of that. Yeah, because that's because the gods, the, the Greek pantheon of gods is a reflection of its contemporary Greek politics, right? And so the gods that we create are a reflection of who we are, right? Mm. Uh, and so I, I would agree with you uh, completely. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons, among many others, why I denied transhumanism in the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Because transhumanism embraces that idea that, you know, uh, and it comes from humanism. And the story of humanism, the way I see it, consists of four points. Point one is the story of progress. Point two is the story of the supremacy and centrality of humanity. Point three is our separation of nature from nature. And the last point is point four, the story of us becoming gods. And I think this kind of story gives us a blank check to do whatever the heck we want. Absolutely. It's, it's dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know that, 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 that was the vision of the Nazis. It was the vision of the communists that, that they both said we're going to evolve beyond the level of human. That's what they said. That's what they believed. And, uh, and you know, I couldn't put it but You put it brilliantly, you know, um, it gives us a blank check to do whatever we want. It's a dangerous idea that we are, and we can be as gods. Will Starr, you've been so generous with your time today. Thank you so much. I appreciate oh, your book. Thank you. And I appreciate your time with us. No, thank you for your amazing questions. It was a really good thorough, you gave me a good thorough going over, Nicola. So I appreciate it. It was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was fun. It was really fun. So thank you. I really loved it because we had a little back and forth and I honestly le learned a lot from that kind of uh, fair and honest and authentic criticism. And I'm going to work on my ideas and correct them. Uh, and this is what good conversations and discussion is. Yeah, about. well, me too. You made me think and reassess and, and question too. So thank you. It was a great chat. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 